You're watching KTCA TV, St. Paul, Minneapolis, Channel 2. It takes two. For more than 75 years, Crisco Shortening has helped provide good foods for your family. The beginning of classic Southwestern cooking, all vegetable, no cholesterol Crisco, proudly salutes the great chefs and foods of the West. Great Chefs of the West, brought to you in part by True Value Hardware and Weber, makers of charcoal grills, gas grills, and fire spice natural cooking woods. True Value and Weber salute Western chefs, masters in the art of natural wood barbecuing. There's a road headed to the west, and it's calling me back again. There's a pale blue sky and a north sunset. I can't forget when you go down home when the sun goes low. Head off the highway to painted western sky. Walk down a warm path through the back door. Cooking in the kitchen and the kettle is warm. Then you sit down. Welcome to Great Chefs of the West, a video symposium of regional cookery offered by Chefs of the West and Southwest. This time, a special edition from the state of Texas, barbecue and wild game. Say hi to Junior, but do it from the inside of your car, which he's quite prone to kick dents in. He is one of the many transplanted animals called Texotics that have exuberantly taken to Texas Hill Country habitat. Imported 50 years ago, they, among other things, offer a new wrinkle in domestic game hunting. For example, this black buck antelope from India will cost you $1,000 plus if shot at the Y.O. Ranch. These animals also represent an attractive source of unusual meat to the chefs of the region. Like Lou Aaron, executive chef at the Sam Houston Restaurant, part of a Y.O. hotel property in Cookville, north of San Antonio. His exotic game pate is a good example of how young American chefs have merged local product with classical concepts. He begins by cutting saika deer meat. The saika is an exotic, originally from Japan. Yeah, that's the deer and the black buck. Right. Pieces of black buck antelope are also used in the pate. Yeah, these are the, the black buck <coughs> livers. Soak them in milk for 24 hours. Pork fat is also used. Here are proportions for the pate. Remove the processed pork fat, then process all the meats separately. It is not necessary to clean the bowl after each processing. of the antelope. The deer meat and antelope liver are pureed and the processed meats are seasoned and mixed. Okay. The seasonings include chopped garlic, seasoning salt, pepper, rosemary, thyme, basil, nutmeg, ground ginger, two eggs, sherry, and whiskey. This is fairly stiff seasoning compared to a classic French pâté, but the stronger game meats will more than stand up to it. Okay. After the mixture is thoroughly stirred, it is poured into a bacon-lined terrine. In another departure from the norm, the bacon has not been blanched first. This is usually done to cut down on the salty smokiness of the bacon, but it does bacon. not adversely affect this redolent game mixture. Also, since this pate is served cold, all spicing is considerably toned down. Bacon strips top the pate before it goes into the oven. Just cover, cover this loosely for about an hour, like that. And just pop it in the oven. Cover loosely with foil and bake for one hour at 325 degrees. Then remove Set. the foil and cook another hour and a half. 
The pate should be refrigerated several hours, preferably overnight, before unmolding. Incidentally, almost any game meats will substitute in this recipe, or you can order the exotic products from several wholesale retail game cooperatives in the Hill Country area. But be prepared, they are not cheap. The pate is served on beef consomme aspic. Garniture includes garlic toast, capers, cornichons, and red onion. Another dish utilizing the Saika deer is a more straightforward, quick saute of tenderloin medallions. The tenderloin is trimmed and cut into three ounce pieces that will be lightly floured before sauteing. The medallions are sautéed in olive oil. Okay. Garnish will include julienned carrots and snow peas. The vegetables are also sautéed in olive oil and will be finished with white wine. Chef Aaron adds sliced chanterelle mushrooms and fresh thyme to the medallions. The pan is deglazed with port wine. Whipping cream is also added, along with about a tablespoon of lingonberry. Most home cooks will find them in jarred form with sugar. They are almost preserves or a jam, so be careful that the sweetness doesn't overpower the sauce. The lingonberries counterbalance, in this case, a very strong game stock reduction. Unless you take the time to do the reduction, use the berries very sparingly or omit altogether. Reduced beef stock may be substituted for the game stock. Steamed rice and the sautéed vegetables are served with the deer medallions. With presentation of medallions of Psycho, we leave the relatively antiseptic restaurant setting for more earthy environs. It's time to fire the grill for a Texas gem, barbecue. You'll find world-class barbecue from Kansas City to Chicago and from Memphis to the Carolinas, but it is to Texas what a crawfish boil is to Louisiana, almost indigenous. Barbecue has always been popular, but it is currently showing up in yuppie chain restaurants, a sure sign that something profitable is afoot. Great barbecue, like almost everything else, lies in the eye of the beholder. So screwing up courage, we began an unscientific and totally normative sampling of some sensational versions of the classic, beginning with the basic, Bo Woffert's beef brisket. He's a Texas native and a retired Air Force Master Sergeant. He now runs a Wyo Ranch hunting lodge in Buda, Texas. He also caters barbecue. As he introduces us to his version of brisket, bear in mind that real Texas barbecue is cooked over wood only, no charcoal. Bo begins by lighting the kindling. That all started since it's good dry wood. This is just some oak bark, and mesquite bark here that I picked up out there. He does not use charcoal lighter since he feels it leaves an unpleasant aftertaste. I have a little of this bigger wood on there. I'll just stack some more of this. I right, got some mesquite on there and I'll put a little bit of oak on it. Get a pretty good fire going right off and then I'm kind of smother it down once I get ready to put my meat on. He uses two-thirds oak wood and one-third hotter burning mesquite. Okay, it's, it's in good shape. Okay, we'll get them seasoned up because I'll need about 20 minutes on the fire anyway. And all I use is 
salt, pepper. I don't put anything else on them because I figure we can put the sauce on them when we get ready to eat them. And that, some people don't like sauce on their barbecue. They just want the meat smell. I rub it in good, and that'll stick with it that way. The brisket is really one of probably the sorest cuts of meat when you get right down to it there is as far as for anything other than barbecue. It, uh, for years, they'd almost give you a brisket in, uh, in the meat markets, uh, but then people started barbecuing them and found out they was good, and they cost you as much as lots of your good cuts of beef do now for steaks and stuff because they most all barbecue places use briskets. That's that's about the only thing it's used for, but most all barbecue places use briskets and, and like I say it uh, it's a sorry cut of meat for anything else, but it does a good job for barbecue. We'll put this on there once the fire gets hot, uh, we'll put it on and uh, we'll start it at a fairly low temperature on the fire because it won't have a have the time to get as hot as it, it will work up to. In a couple of hours, it'll be at as hot as we want it. And we're going to cook it about 12 hours. It, uh, uh, to cook a brisket, a good size brisket like this, it takes about 12 hours. And more or less cook with, cook with coals and smoke is what primarily we want to do. We don't want to cook with much flames at all. And that's the idea here. If you notice, I got my fire way back in the back. And I don't want it. I don't want much fire right under the meat at all. I want to, I want to cook with a uh, heat away from the fire, and if uh, because if you do, you'll you'll burn them before you cook them. First thing I do is take that, and if you notice that crust that we've got, it's just a sixteenth of an inch thick there. But this is all just fat, so I just kind of slice most of that off, and get the side, and then start cutting it right on the very corner right there, just like so. We'll slice it right on off. And I can, I say any time that I do barbecue and if I've got this red ring right here around it, I feel like I've done my job. Uh, Ignoring crabby liberationists, Bo allows one fourth pound per person unless it's all men, then it's half a pound. Smells like barbecue. We'll take a more slice off of it. Any time I serve barbecue, I try to slice it as I serve it, kind of, because it dries out awful fast. Barbecue sauce is not used during cooking as a baste, but is served on the side. Much more elaborate than, say, Kreitz Market in Lockhart, Texas. It's like a funny story that flops. To appreciate Kreitz Market, you have to be there. It began as a meat market in 1900. Today, Don and Rick Schmidt own it, but little else has changed. If you want sauce with your meat, bring your own. The reason is simple. When the Kreitz method of smoking was developed, barbecue sauce didn't exist. Beyond that, Kreitz offers a good example of Texas barbecue technique. At Kreitz, only post oak wood is used. They burn about 100 cords a year. started about 6 a.m. with kindling and some hot coals saved from the day before. By 6.30 a.m., the meat goes on and is ready by 11. The meats include a beef cut called clod, pork loin, Kreitz's own sausage, and boned prime rib. The clods are beef shoulder. 12 to 15 pound pieces are squared off for more even cooking. They are seasoned with salt, black and cayenne pepper the day before smoking. 95% of Kreitz's sales is shoulder clod meat. The homemade sausage is 85% beef and 15% pork. It, too, is utter simplicity. A grain and flour binder is added, and the sausage is seasoned with salt, pepper, and cayenne. After the rings are cased, the sausage is cooked twice. First, it is smoked in a small unit. When the sausage drips, it's done, then refrigerated overnight. The next day, it is put on the large pit and reheated for about a half hour. 2,500 to 3,500 rings are sold every day. But the shoulder clods go on first. Clods smoked the day before are placed furthest from the fire. The cooking is done over indirect heat. The smoke and heat are drawn across the meat by ventilation. The heat of the grill nearest the fire can get as high as 600 degrees. Hence, uncooked meat is started nearest the fire. The heat of the pit is affected by temperature and humidity. 
Rick Schmidt says that he only uses a thermometer in the pit when magazine writers or TV people come around. Usually, he gauges the temperature by the color and the sound of the flame. These cloths take about anywhere from four and a half, and four to five hours to cook. So we put them on early. Later in the morning, we put on boneless prime rib and our pork to time them to get done somewhere around 11 o'clock. The pork loin takes about two hours to cook and the prime rib about three. Beef purists may be floored at the idea of smoking prime rib, but the finished product is delicious. Temperature control is achieved by moving the meat. The heat from the fire is constant. The proximity of the meats to the fire is the variable. It's an impressive juggling feat and one the Schmitz have obviously mastered. barbecue house is the Salt Lick near Austin. It's owned by Hisako Roberts. Her late husband Thurman got tired of building bridges so built a circular open grill instead and put Driftwood Texas on the map. Tim Ader does most of the cooking at Salt Lick and to contrast it with Kreitz's market he uses only mesquite wood. This is significant since mesquite burns hot. His meat of choice is brisket seasoned like Kreitz's with salt, black pepper and cayenne. But at Salt Lick pork ribs are also used a little unusual in Texas, where beef ribs are prevalent. We've always used the pork ribs here because we think that they're basically a lot tenderer and they have a lot better taste to them than the beef ribs do. They're not as large. They cook a little quicker. The diameter of the open grill was determined by Thurman Roberts' arm reach. The meat sits about three feet above the level of the wood fire, and Tim Ada plays the grill like a Steinway. He sears on the hottest pot first, then rotates the brisket and ribs as necessary. The brisket is cooked 12 hours, then refrigerated overnight. The next day, it is put on the back of the grill and cooked another four hours. Okay, after the meat's cooked probably about 45 minutes, I'll go ahead and turn it over after the first side's been seared, and then we baste it. I'll go ahead and start knocking the coals underneath the, the brisket to try to build up the heat under the pit, trying to cook it about 180, 200 degrees. Go ahead and get the smoke operating on the meat. The ribs have cooked for about 10 minutes and they were ready to, to be turned. A commercial sausage is also served at Salt Lick, but the most distinguishing feature here is their sauce. Once seared, the briskets are basted with it throughout the cooking process. Of course, since Salt Lick is so popular, it is axiomatic that the sauce recipe is a secret. It was invented by Hisako so Roberts. So I had to devise a, a barbecue sauce because barbecue sauce always has been served with barbecue here. And uh, uh, so uh, at that time, uh, being very frugal, I used to save all the pickled uh, peach uh, juices because they were so good. You know, it had cinnamon and cloves, and uh, it has the flavor of peaches. So in the beginning, I would take uh, oil and vinegar and uh, the peach juices and salt and pepper and add it. Then uh, we got to the point where I was adding more spices and finally ended up with more spices than, uh, than the colonel has with his chicken. Basically, the salt lick sauce is an emulsion, like a salad dressing. It is not heated, but mixed cold, and does not contain tomato. The color comes from paprika. Originally, Mrs. Roberts used the juice from pickled peaches, which suggests the key taste factor, sweet and sour. It's a remarkable sauce, and when poured over salt lick barbecue, memorable. Increasingly, young chefs are taking basic barbecue principles and translating them into fancier restaurant versions. Scott Phillip, chef at Las Canarias in San Antonio, is one. He employs the smoking process and barbecue sauce in a duck breast invention. He begins by trimming the duck. Much now we can take the duck. Uh, 
place it in a brine. Brine consists of orange juice, um, water, salt, oranges, limes, and pickling spice. I'll bring this to a boil uh, and then cool it off. Uh, if it sits for a day or so, the flavor will develop a little bit better in it. We'll place the duck in the brine. And we want to submerge it. The duck should stay in the brine for about four to six hours before smoking. After the duck's been brined for a while, about four to six hours, we'll take it out and we'll place it in a smoker um, using uh, mesquite wood chips. Uh, it should smoke approximately about 15 to 30 minutes, depending on how hot your smoker is. Um, we usually run ours at about 130, 140 degrees, about 140 degrees. Once the duck is smoked, we'll take it out, put it on a roasting pan, and roast it 300 degrees for about half an hour. The chef begins the barbecue sauce by sauteing diced bacon. Next, minced onion. I had about one onion minced. A green and red bell pepper are diced and added to the onions. become a little tender, we're going to add uh, about five chopped tomatoes that have been peeled and seeded, about a half an ounce of garlic, once it's been sautéed a little bit, we're going to add about 24 ounces of apple cider vinegar. We're going to let that reduce down a little bit to about half. Add 12 ounces of honey. Thirty-six ounces of chili sauce. ounces of tomato paste. About eight ounces of brown sugar. Four tablespoons of chili powder. Mix this up, bring it to a boil, and let it simmer for about one hour. Meanwhile, after the duck has roasted for a half hour, let it cool another 30 minutes before boning. We're going to take and cut on both sides of the breastbone, and both sides of the backbone. Take and try to separate the wing from the carcass. It's about an incision right about there. Something you just got to play with it a little bit on both sides. Okay. With your finger, you want to get in down to the carcass, trying to get the duck tenderloin and everything all together. And peel this away from the carcass, separating the wing bone from the main part of the carcass. And lay that on the table and just pull everything away from it. OK, 
Okay, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to remove these bones. Take the wing bone. You want to carefully cut around it so you won't cut into the skin of the duck. pull right out so there's no mark no big cuts in the skin also with the thigh bone cut on both sides of it around it comes right out brush the duck with barbecue sauce Since these are already cooked, place them in the oven for about five to ten minutes to heat them up a little bit more. A pecan stuffing that features sponge cake instead of standard bread is molded for presentation. Sautéed green onions and pecans finish presentation. We hope you enjoyed this special Texas edition. Explore the excitement of more American cooking next time.